Good morning, Simi Community Church. Well, we have decided to not hold in-person services this Sunday because a number of people in our congregation have tested positive for COVID, and it seems like that all started last Sunday. Uh, after the service, people started getting some symptoms, and we wanted to make sure that we were safe and sound, and we've got a great service in person next Sunday that we wanted to make sure that's 14 days from when symptoms started. And uh, the youth group is going to be sharing uh, their testimonies about how God changed their lives at Hume Lake this summer. There's going to be a slideshow, and I'm going to have a message that's geared toward the students. And I'm sure that it's going to uh, encourage all of us to walk strong with the Lord. So I wanted to make sure we were safe and sound for next Sunday. So we're doing this online today. We're going to have some worship in a minute, and then I'm going to be sharing a, a message that I did three months ago at a church in La Crescenta for the search committee. And I'm sure that God's going to uh, use it to bless your socks off. So let's get into some worship, and then we'll open up the Word together, and then we'll move along from there.
my time has come, still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forever. the highest king will welcome me. I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who oh, the
Amen. You guys got a great pastor here, don't you? Wow. How many of you were here last week? Last week? Whose house is this? <laughs> That's right. What a great message that was. Uh, the last time that I spoke here, that I had the opportunity to open God's Word here, was 20 years ago. Back when my hair was all brown. <laughs> Yes, my hair has been turning on me, but I made a deal with my hair, so it's okay. I said, you can turn on me, you just can't leave. <laughs> so far, so good. Uh, anyone here getting uh, tired of these COVID restrictions? Any, just a couple. I was in the store the other day getting a present um, for one of my family members in a store called Lululemon. And I was going in, had my mask on, everything set, going to go through the door, and the girl at the door says, uh-uh-uh. We are filled to capacity. You'll have to wait in line. So I went around to wait in line, and as I was in line, I peered through the window, and I seriously only counted six people in the entire big store. So when I got to the front, I said, uh, ma'am, I counted only six people in the store. She goes, six people is our limit. We are filled to capacity. So I walked across the street and went to Walmart, <laughs> And literally, there were a thousand people in there. So I went to the lady at the door and I said, what is your capacity? And she goes, we don't have one. Come on in and bring your whole family. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, that started getting me to think about the Christian life. Because seriously, a lot of people that I know as Christians uh, have a six-person capacity for the Holy Spirit in their life. And others seem to have endless amounts of resources that they are allowed the Holy Spirit to work through. So I want to talk to you this morning about this concept of being filled to capacity by the Holy Spirit. Amen. My Bible is open to Acts chapter 4. I would invite you to turn there with me in your Bible or on your phone. Acts chapter 4. The context of Acts chapter 4 is Acts chapter 3. And so in Acts chapter 3, Peter and John are going into the temple and they encounter a crippled man. They heal him in Jesus' name. And after they did that, the religious leaders didn't like that very much. They threw them in jail. Before they let them out, they commanded them not to preach or teach in the name of Jesus again. So they left, and they went out preaching and teaching in the name of Jesus. Amen. And so they got called in again to the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders. And they told them, we can't help speaking. So they said, you know what? They threatened them again. Bad things are going to happen to you if you teach in the name of Jesus ever again. They let them go. And so Peter and John decided to pray. Now we're in Acts chapter 4 and verse 29. Look at what it says. They prayed, now Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to live a life of comfort. Please let us not go into the jail again. Lord, allow your servants not to suffer pain or agony. Oh, sorry. I'm on the wrong version, I think. Let me get that again here. It says, Now the Lord, now they said, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to what? Speak your word with great boldness. Verse 30, stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And verse 31 says, and after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God boldly. Amen. They prayed the first thing they did was pray. You can do more than pray after you've prayed, but until you've prayed, you can't do anything. Amen? You can do more than pray after you've prayed, but until you've prayed, you can't do anything. I saw a bumper sticker that said, when all else fails, pray. And at first I thought, that's cool, a bumper sticker about prayer. But then I thought, why wait until all else fails? Why not pray before all else fails, right? Yeah. I worked on staff uh, 
a number of years with Chuck Swindoll in Fullerton. And he used to tell us all the time, he said, if you show me a person's checkbook and let me go through it, I will tell you all about their spiritual life with great accuracy. That's pretty true. But I also think that if you show me a person's prayer journal and let me go through it, I'll tell you all about their focus and purpose in life with great accuracy. A couple of weeks ago, I was asked to consider a pastoral job in Florida. And I went on the church's website and I pulled up the bulletin. And on the bulletin, they had a full page of prayer requests. And I thought, that's pretty cool. They list that in the bulletin. But then I started reading through the prayer requests, and what I noticed was amazing. Every single prayer request was for someone's ankle to get better, someone's knee is hurting, someone's arm is not there. All physical ailments that people wanted to be taken out of their pain. They wanted to be restored back to a comfort level. Now listen, there is nothing wrong with praying for physical things, is there? God wants us to share everything. He cares about everything about us. But when your prayers center only around physical pain being removed from your life, then Houston, we have a problem, right? There is a verse in the Old Testament, Psalm 37, 4, that says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Great verse. But I've had a lot of friends in my life talk to me about that and say, Tony, see, just, just ask God what you want, and he's going to give it to you. He cares about your heart's desires. And something never sat right with that to me. And I started looking into this, and I started saying, wait a minute, it's obvious. He will give you the desires of your heart is predicated by delight yourself in the Lord first. See, there's a concept that when you start delighting yourself in the Lord, and you start getting your thoughts and your heart, your mind on God's ways, something changes in your prayers. You don't pray for what you used to all the time. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, God tells us, he said, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So if I'm just thinking my own thoughts and my own desires, that doesn't say that those are God's, and that's not the heart of God per se. I have to consciously tell myself, delight yourself in the Lord first, and then my prayers start to change. My heart starts to pray more toward the heart of God and what he has for me and other people. Amen? Amen. Peter and John, their prayers were definitely in the right place. They were praying the heart of God. They didn't pray for their comfort. Verse 31 says that after Peter and John prayed, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. The word is earthquake. It was physically shaken. Now listen, Satan can shake up our world, can't he? But I want you to know too that God can also shake up our world. Satan's not the only one. The difference is that Satan shakes up our world to bring us down. God shakes up our world to build us up better than we were before. Sometimes when our lives are comfortable, the good stuff in our lives settles down to the bottom, the deep things in our lives. It settles down to the bottom, and so God shakes up your life a little bit, and it gets you to start thinking of, wow, these deep things start coming to the top, and they're useful. When you, go, uh, when you get sick, you go to a doctor. He scribbles on a piece of paper, gives it to you, Incidentally, if uh, you can read it, it's not a real doctor. <laughs> Go find a real doctor. You shouldn't be able to read that prescription. You take the prescription to the pharmacy. They give you a bottle of medicine. You go home, and before you take that, you look on the side of the bottle, and it says, before you take it, you must first shake it. Why? 
Because medicine is heavy. And the heavy, good, healthy, healing medicines settle to the bottom of the bottle. And when you shake it, it brings them all up into the top where they can be useful for the healing process. Sometimes the, uh, the deep things in our lives we can't access until God shakes up our world a little bit. 150 years ago, God shook up, shook up our country, the Civil War. It wasn't pleasant. Families were divided against families, cities against cities, states against states. But I'll tell you what, the shaking was necessary to get to a good place because it freed people from physical slavery. In our lives, when God shakes us up, he shakes up our bottle to get those deep things to the top, he might be, might be trying to free us from something that's held us in bondage for a while. We didn't even know it. Maybe from bad news relationships that we'd be better if we weren't in. Maybe from abusive situations or self-destructive patterns we've allowed in our lives and we don't realize they're self-destructive, but they're heading us down instead of heading us up. And so God shakes up our life a little bit. I think by far though, the worst thing that can shackle a born-again Christian is living a life of mediocrity. A spiritual lukewarmness, merely existing, just tiptoeing through life in order to arrive at death safely. That's not the Christian life. Comfort's not what it's all about. And so God will shake you up to get some of that good stuff to the bottom. Here's a problem I've noticed in my own life. When God shakes up my life, I ask one question of him. How long? How many of you have had a tough year? <laughs> it's been one incredible year. There's been a lot of shaking going on, right? Well, I ask God, how long, Lord? How long? And I wish I could answer that for you, but I don't have the exact answer. But I do know this. I do know that when I was a kid, I had a piggy bank. And it was an evil piggy bank. Do you know the difference? A good piggy bank has a cork on the bottom. So when you want to take some money out, you, you just open it, shake it out. The evil piggy bank I had had nothing. If I wanted to take out what I had put into it, I would have to break the bank. Well, I found a loophole. <laughs> my brothers were going to 7-Eleven on their bikes. They were going to bring back some candy, and I wanted some candy. So I went to my piggy bank, and I turned it upside down, and I started shaking that thing. And all of a sudden, a penny dropped out. Yes! a penny, then a dime, yes, and a quarter, yes, and I kept shaking that piggy bank because the money was coming out slowly but surely. And I asked the question, Lord, how long are you going to shake up my world? It seems to have been a really long time now. How long, Lord? I don't know the answer to that, but I do know this. I shook that piggy bank until I got out of it Everything I had put into it. Come on. Satan shakes your world to bring you down, but God shakes your world to build you up. Amen. Peter and John are an example of that. In verse 31, it says, After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Something I want you to take away from this morning. When God fills you with his Holy Spirit, it's not that you get more of him. He gets more of you. Did you hear that? It's not that, it's not that you get more of God. God gets more of you. Peter told us in 2 Peter 1.3, he said that God... His divine power has given us, as Christians, everything we need for life and for godliness. So you're telling me the God creator of the universe, God Almighty, has given us everything we need for life and for godliness? 
If God has given us everything we need, then I ask the question, why is it that some people seem to be used more of God or have more of God than other people? I mean, you can look at people in your life, Christians, and you go, oh, God really uses this person, and other people, yeah, they're nice. You can tell right away, can't you? And I want to know then, if God's given us everything we need, why is it that some people seem to have more of God than others? When I study the Bible, I use a Bible program on my computer. And for years, I've been purchasing more and more things and resources to use in this Bible program. But it's interesting because I recently got a new computer and I had to download the program. And I had to download everything they have in the program. 18,000 books. Problem. I have only purchased 6,000 books. So even though I have 18,000 books available at my disposal, if circumstances were right, I don't have access to all of it because I have only worked to get the money to purchase 6,000. My access to those books is only 6,000, and I've got to do some work to get some money to pay for more books, and they'll give me a key that just opens up those new books. But they already existed in my hard drive. Does that make sense? God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. We just have not learned exactly how to access everything we need. Amen. Some of us are Lululemon stores. Others of us are Walmarts. That's the way it is. Paul uh, defines this more. He tells us where this access takes place in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16. Paul says, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit. He may strengthen you with power through his spirit, where? In your inner being. He wants to strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. And why? Verse 19 says that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. See, we don't have a fullness problem. We have a capacity problem. See, your fullness depends on your capacity. Your capacity is determined in your inner being. In La Crescenta here, we are about 30 miles from the ocean. If you wanted to go down to the ocean and bring some water back, you'd have to carry a container with you to bring it back in, right? So if I went to the ocean with a little thimble, I could go down to the ocean, fill it up with water, bring it back here, and I would have a thimble full of water, but I wouldn't have any more than a thimble because that's all I brought down to the ocean was a thimble. If I brought a glass down to the ocean, I could fill it up with water, bring it back here, but I, wouldn't, I would have a full glass of water, but I wouldn't have any more than the glass of water because all I brought down to the ocean was a glass. If I brought a bucket down to the ocean and filled it up with water, I could bring it back here, and I would have a bucket full of water, but I wouldn't have any more than a bucket full of water because all I brought down to the ocean was a bucket. I could bring a doughboy pool on a flatbed truck down to the ocean and fill that puppy up with water and bring it back here, and I would have a pool full of water, wouldn't I? But I wouldn't have any more than a pool full of water because all I brought down to the ocean was the pool. Many Christians, many Christians cry out, God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. But my friends... God will not allow you to be filled more than your thimble worth of capacity can hold. Somebody say, ouch. We don't have a fullness problem. We have a capacity problem. And our fullness depends on our capacity, but our capacity is determined in our inner being. Your time with the Lord this morning your prayer time tonight with your wife. And after they prayed, it says the place where they were meeting was shaken. 
And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And look at the result. And they spoke the word of God boldly. Peter and John got prayed up. Then they got shaken up. Then they got filled up. And now they spoke up. They spoke the word of God boldly. Most Christians in our world today are like the Arctic River, frozen at the mouth. <laughs> Sharing our faith is a little scary, but I will tell you one person that I know that that was not the case with from this church. He was a friend of mine 20 years ago, about 70 years old back then, John Russell. I'll tell you, John had been through a lot in his life. He uh, messed up, but he owned up. He came back, engaged, and went full on for God. And when there were situations in our church here that were just bickering and complaints and things, and everyone's talking about it, he never engaged. And I said, what do you think about that, John? He goes, ah, I don't have time for that. Life's too short, hell's too hot. I'll tell you what he was talking about with me all the time. A couple of college students on his block, on the corner with skateboards. He always told me, man, I, I talked to those guys again. I saw them out there, so I just went out and talked to them for an hour. And I'm just, they just don't seem to understand how much they need Jesus. And I, I want them to know so badly, Tony, so badly. On my wrist, I wear a one of my little bands here. You probably can't see it, but it's, um, it's plastic, but it looks like barbed wire. It's from Open Door Ministries, the persecuted church. I wear this, and on it, it says, one with them. Who is the them? The persecuted church. It reminds me that in our world, 70% of Christians in this world, 70% of Christians in this world, if they share about their faith in Jesus with someone else, they will be persecuted, thrown in jail, beaten, whipped, tortured, threatened. Something will happen to them. But the reason I wear this is not just to pray for them. It's to pray for me. Because they're persecuted and bad things will happen to them. But Jesus and the story of life transformation they have is so overwhelming to them, they don't care about going to jail. They tell their story anyway. They're going to get beaten. So what? I, I got beaten for Christ, you know? And they, they don't have the privileges I have, and yet they share their faith all the time. I do have the privilege, and I don't. That's why I wear this. I pray for them, but I also pray for me. John Russell took advantage of the privilege. Peter and John did also. Look at what it says in chapter 4, verse 18. Verse 18 says, Then they called them in again a second time after the jailing and threats and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Verse 19. But Peter and John replied, <laughs> Judge for yourselves whether it's right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen or heard. We cannot help it. We can't help it. Are you kidding me? Jesus changed our lives. He's the Messiah. How can I not share that with you? The only thing you can share is what you've experienced. If you haven't seen it, you can't share it. If you haven't experienced it, you can't express it. But if you have, then you can. And I think you should. Why? Why? Because your story is unique. Your story is the only one like it in the entire world. And if you withhold it, you are literally robbing the world of hearing 
about the unique story of how God transformed your life because no one else has your story. And here's another thing. Your story no one can argue with ever. They can argue with your theology. Like, I don't believe that Jesus even walked on earth. I don't believe Jesus rose from the dead. I don't believe he was killed. I don't believe that he was God. They can argue with your theology. And we get stuck there. We say, I don't know enough to share with someone else. What if they ask questions? But when you share your story, they can't argue with you. What are they going to say? You were not happier after you met Jesus. You didn't feel the joy come waving over you and Jesus you gave your life to Christ. You, you, you weren't happy when Jesus, he didn't answer your prayers. Yes, he did. I can walk. Look at this. What are they really going to say? They cannot argue with your story at all. I'll tell you this. If you want to grow a church, it's not through fancy programs. Although that can help here and there. You want to grow a church biblically, you want to grow a church biblically. It's when average, ordinary people like you and I share with other average, ordinary people that are far from God. And we tell them that our lives have been changed. That's it. My life has changed. I'm so happy now. I'm studying his word with other people and we're getting encouragement for life right now. We share, we share how God has changed our lives because changed lives change lives. Change lives, change lives. Say that with me. Change lives, change lives. The question is, do you actually believe that? Do you actually believe that just an average, ordinary person sharing the story of how their life has been changed by Jesus is actually going to change the world? Guess what? Peter and John believed it. And guess what? They changed the world. Amen. And you can too. And so can I. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you so much for the privilege that is ours, God. The privilege of one, having you change our lives. Thank you so much that our lives are not what they used to be. Thank you so much for the joy of the Lord that overcomes everything in my life. Thank you so much that we have a story to tell. Thank you so much that you want to use our story. God, would you help our prayers to align with your heart and not just our own desires? Would you help us to pray your heart for things in our lives? Lord, when the shaking up in our lives gets to be long and hard, would you help us to see the deep things that you're trying to bring to the surface of our lives that got lost in the times of comfort? God, would you fill us with your Holy Spirit, but also remind us that you fill us with your Spirit only to the capacity that we've allowed. And God, fill us up so that we might speak your word boldly. And would you change this church into the type of place that is marked by the word transformation? Would people see changed lives? And would you continue the process of changing lives as we share about our lives that have been changed? We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I trust that God spoke to your heart and mind today and hope that you are able to internalize it and see what God wants you to do in your further steps to use the Holy Spirit's guidance in your life and your capacity to be filled by the Holy Spirit. Uh, remember, next Sunday we have an in-person service again, and it's going to be the youth group ser service, and we're going to have uh, testimonies from camp and videos and a message from me. Uh, directed toward the students that I think we'll all be encouraged by. So have a great week, and we'll see you in person here at Simi Community Church next Sunday morning. God bless you.